Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text that engages us this morning comes from the Advent series that we have been following through this uh, our midweek worship services on Wednesdays during the season of Advent. It's a fa- series called Family Life. And we'll be finishing out that series here on Sunday and, and uh, again on Christmas morning. Family life. When you think about those two words, what comes to mind? How about this? Norman Rockwell. Father's at the head of the dinner table, you know, carving the roast. Mother is wearing her unsoiled apron, beaming over the meal in matronly elegance. The children are gathered dutifully at the table, obedient and rosy-cheeked. And when Christmas rolls around, well, family life is absolutely perfect. Now, when you live family life, what comes to mind? How about this? Dad might be over there snoring on the couch. Mom is completely maxed out. The younger kids just won't stop fighting. The adolescent son is locked up in his room with his music pounding, shaking the walls. The oldest daughter, well, she's locked onto her phone, showing no signs of looking up anytime soon. Family life, according to Norman Rockwell, has no hassles, no headaches. But real family life faces challenges, painful predicaments. Loved ones die. Children make bad decisions. Parents get divorced. Money gets tight. And who's going to go to the nursing home to visit mom this week? As we think about the Christmas story, It's easy for us to imagine Mary and Joseph having a Norman Rockwell family life, right? I mean, they're in the Bible after all. Yeah, maybe not so much. Let's take a look. It starts right away in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Now husbands, imagine your wife coming up to you and telling you she's pregnant. And that the baby isn't yours, but rather it is the Holy Spirit's who was responsible for this unexpected news. How would you react to that? No big deal, right? (laughs) I mean, surely, surely you wouldn't have any concerns about what may or may not have transpired in the last few weeks. Can you imagine 15-year-old Mary going to her 20-something fiancé, Joseph, You know, Joseph's there. Maybe he's talking about floor plans or wall colors, getting ready for their new home. You know, his mind's focused on getting ready for things and preparing. And and, and Mary, all the while, has this this huge bombshell to drop on him, right? Joseph, we, we, we need to talk. Honey, I'm pregnant. So long, Norman Rockwell. Things just got real. Now, I think I can speak with absolute certainty that there's no one in this room that has dealt with spiritual conception. But you have had your moments as a family where you've been tested to new limits. Where you have reached the point of wondering what in the world am I going to do in this moment? How do I react to this? What's my next move? Maybe you're in one of those moments right now. See, there are a lot of different ways that we can react in those moments. You know, one of those ways is to simply close the door. That's our first option. 
know, Joseph's response was to actually close the door right away. We see it in verse 18. That the, when we find out that the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that. Mary knew that. But Joseph didn't know that. All he could think about was that Mary had been unfaithful. And it must have torn him up. I mean, Joseph's heart must have been broken into a million pieces when he heard that news. Matthew continues in verse 19. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now there's a huge difference between our modern idea of engagement and that of a first century Jew. You know, this verse describes Joseph as already being Mary's husband. And it uses the word divorce to describe ending an engagement, not a marriage. And though they were not yet living together, nor were they officially married, Joseph and Mary did have a binding contract that could be terminated only by death or by divorce. So Joseph chose the latter, to divorce Mary quietly. I mean, after all, he's not that gullible. Mary said that the Holy Spirit's the cause of her pregnancy, but how many of you would believe that? I mean, it's clear to Joseph that Mary wasn't the person that he thought he married or was intending to marry. Joseph doesn't want to talk about it or work through it, so he just simply chooses to close the door. Now, when family conflict comes our way, we sometimes react just like Joseph. I mean, let's say there's, you have a, a neat and tidy wife who likes a certain amount of law and order in the home, but her carefree husband just doesn't give a rip. So the wife complains. Look at this mess. Nobody ever picks up anything around here. The clueless husband simply says, Relax, dear. I mean, you're always so uptight about things couple exchanges, cliches, and facts back and forth, but they don't actually directly address the problem. Close the door. When all hell breaks loose, another option is to slam the door. In the Old Testament, the penalty for adultery was stoning. Thankfully, Joseph forgoes this option, even though he had every right to do so. But he doesn't want to embarrass Mary or disgrace her or hurt her, for that matter. He just wants to move on without her. On one level, this is commendable. Matthew actually calls it uh, a righteous thing. He calls him a righteous man there in verse 19. But when faced with similar family pain, sometimes we aren't as righteous. No, we slam the door. We drop verbal bombs. We rant, we rave, we have tempers, we throw tantrums, we fight like cats and dogs. Discussion's over. Lines are drawn, and we pull out all the stops because after all, we have the right after what was done to us. Well, another way of handling family hurt is to lock the door. This is what Joseph is is actually planning to do. Total withdrawal. Lock the door. It's too broken. I'm done. The issue's so sensitive, so intense, so explosive that we lock the door and throw away the key. The potential pain we might endure just isn't worth it. But there's another way that God invites us into. It's a way that takes faith, courage. A way that we can only consider with God's help. Holding on to His promises. And that's to open the door. This is ultimately the path that Joseph takes. But it's only with God's help. In verse 20 it says, But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, 
Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. God reveals truth to Joseph. A truth that makes no sense. Only that it comes from the mouth of the Lord. And what else can you do but trust Him? Joseph needed help with family life. That's why God speaks to him in a dream. In fact, four times in the first two chapters of Matthew, we are told that God speaks to Joseph in a dream. We need help with our family life as well. Martin Luther teaches us to say that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. When we use our own reason and strength, we close doors. We slam doors. We lock doors. But Luther continues, But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. The same God who spoke truth to Joseph in a dream speaks truth into your family today. God's Holy Spirit calls you by the gospel, speaks truth into your life. You know, God tells Joseph, what is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is not just only conceived by the Holy Spirit. We see at his baptism that he is filled with the Holy Spirit. When tempted in the wilderness, that he is empowered by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus died, he gave up his spirit. Three days later, Jesus was raised by the Spirit. And the first gift that Jesus gives after his resurrection is the Holy Spirit. This same Spirit calls us by the gospel, delivering all of the gifts purchased and won by our Savior. Mercy, forgiveness, new life, and the power in the midst of deep family pain, the power to look at our spouses, our children, our parents, our siblings, in the middle of our conflicts, and open the door. In the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, the book entitled, The Final, The Last Battle, C.S. Lewis describes his characters facing the mother of all battles. Serious conflict. In a climactic point of the story, they come to this door. Now some claim that behind this door is a life-threatening monster. Don't go anywhere in it. Don't open it. Don't go through there. You'll regret it. But once they go through the door, it says... They stood on green grass. The deep blue sky overhead and the air blew gently on their faces like that of a day in early summer. Walking through the door took them into a heavenly kingdom. And once there, they could continue to go further and further in, making wonderful discoveries. What's the point? Open your foreboding door. Open your heart. Open your ears. Open your life to the people in your family. The door isn't as threatening as it looks. In fact, when you open the door, maybe not at first, but soon enough, you will find yourself standing in a place that only God could create a place of joy, a place where light overcomes darkness. Where grace prevails. A place where the love of God has overcome all things and endures all things. 
In the name of Jesus, amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.